वसुदेवसुत कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्णम वंदे जगद्गुरु राइट वेलकम बैक टू द भगवद गीता क्लास देर वॉज आई नो एन इंटरप्शन एंड आई एम एंटाली टू ब्लेम but uh, we are back again at least for a while um we are doing the 12th chapter of the bhagavad gita 18 chapters we have started the 12th chapter and the 12th chapter is called uh, bhakti yoga the yoga of bhakti the yoga of love of devotion it's a very beloved chapter many people begin the bhagavad gita with the 12th chapter um Uh, Arjuna begins by asking a question that you have taught us better whose yoga is better and that's how he phrased it and Sri Krishna's answer was unambiguous for people who are partial to the way of knowledge like many here <laughs> it is difficult because Sri Krishna says the way of love is better the one who follows the way of love way of devotion knows yoga better is a better yogin why and krishna answers that too he says that for those who are embodied embodied in the sense everybody is embodied every yogi is only because you are embodied that you are a yogi but those who are deeply attached to their bodily identification it's sort of unshakable i am this this body this person and that's it nothing more than this so uh this one it's very difficult krishna says it's very difficult for such a one to follow the path of knowledge whereas the path of devotion is easier easier in many respects one thing is the path of knowledge the path of meditation jnana dhyana dhyana is the path of meditation jnana is the path of knowledge they all have a high ask the entry barriers are high so in the path of knowledge we know they say the adhikari the the qualified student has to be a person who has strong viveka vairagya these terms we are familiar with the discernment between the eternal and the non eternal that there is some ultimate reality and this world is transitory and ever changeful and then followed up by dispassion for this changeful transitory world and the pursuit of that eternal reality then the disciplines control of the mind control of the senses putting up with uh, ups and downs in the world you know difficult circumstances following your your spiritual quest uh, in spite of difficulties in the world a lot of qualifications and they are all at the beginning right at the right of the what, what's the phrase right of the bat right of the bat you have to have those otherwise the way of knowledge is not going to work for you whereas in the way of devotion bhakti all we are asked to do is begin just begin wherever you are however you are uh, with whatever little emotion one has just begin with a little but a simple faith that there is something to this and say one might even say I don't have much faith and I certainly don't have much love for God but well, whatever you have begin with that you see self effort it's interesting that on the path of um morality dharma yeah. to do good and to avoid evil the path of dharma says uh, uh, keep on doing good moral action you accumulate good karma thereby and uh, this good karma it results in a pleasant life in this world and takes you to heaven afterwards and so and so forth this is called dharma this is the path of dharma it is entirely dependent on self effort the way of good works and that it's not spiritual it just ensures a good life here and that you go to one of those many 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 heavens after death and then again come back to this life and so on so you accumulate good uh, good karma and uh, better life basically an ethical life a moral life which is very important which is fundamental for spiritual life but entirely entirely uh, self effort self it's a struggle 
the path of yoga, meditation, the path of yoga is entirely self-effort. Yama, Niyama, the, the eight-limbed eight yoga, Yama and Niyama, the disciplines, the moral disciplines, the do's and don'ts. And then asana, sitting still. It can be quite difficult sitting still actually. <laughs> asana, sitting. You might think that sitting is pretty easy. In though it isn't. <laughs> Try sitting like a yogi for, for hours and hours. It isn't easy. The pranayama. You might think even breathing is easy. But do we have to learn breathing? Yes, we have to. One of the first of the Hatha Yoga teachers who came to the United States. I think it was Iyengar probably. BK Sanger. Those of you who have an empty chair next to you, just raise your hand because there are one or two people coming in who might need a chair. No empty chairs? Okay. Yeah, so the younger people can come and sit in the front. Yeah, those who can manage it, younger people, if you want to come, you can come and sit in the front and leave the chairs for um, those who. You can sit like a yogi. Yeah. <laughs> In the fr in front, come here. Yeah. Not all of you. That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. All right. So, um, one of the first y uh, yoga teachers to come to the West. He writes in his book. I think it was B K S Anger. Uh, he says that. He found, here, actually he started off here in New York. He found that people were hardly breathing at all. <laughs> and uh, breathing is important. Huh? It's, it's highly adv advisable. So come, come sit there. Yeah. If you can sit there. Now one or two chairs are empty, I think, now. Yeah. All right. Um, so breathing, pranayama, dharana, dhyana, samadhi. Uh, focus and then meditation and then of course absorption samadhi these are all very difficult and all of them demand self-effort up to samadhi up uh, up to dhyana meditation self-effort and yes of course after that the absorption absorption samadhi comes by itself by persisting in meditation but anyway a lot of self-effort and especially self-effort at very subtle levels is required in the path of meditation path of knowledge jnana Again, self-effort. There are uh, there are spiritual practices which are preliminary and which are which are central. The preliminary practices I just mentioned, the viveka, vairagya. One has to cultivate those dispassion and uh, discernment and the disciplines. Then the uh, inner practices or the advanced practices, which is shravana, manana, nididhyasana, the um, hearing and reflection and meditation. So we systematically you study Vedanta, like we are doing now, this is Shravana, but also think over it and then meditate upon what you have gained, the clarity that is so attained. All of that is self-effort. The point here is, look, all of this is self-effort. You might say, what's your point then? The point is this. In the path of Bhakti, however, Krishna is pointing out here, in the path of Bhakti, however, in contrast, from the very beginning, the devotee, the lover of God, depends on God, not on his or her own self-effort. You can make self-effort, but one also feels that that self-effort is also the blessing of God. So I surrender to the Lord from the very beginning, and whatever happens, my only practice is surrender. My only practice is loving God. And to the extent that I can, if I, if I cannot, that also I surrender. But I, I continuously hold on. That one thing that I don't surrender is surrendering. So continuous they are holding on to the Lord and then in all other paths, self-effort and result. Uh, sadhana and sadhya. Sadhya means goal. Sadhana means the effort, the, the practices put in to get to the goal. But here it's not like that. Here you depend entirely on the grace of the Lord. So the path of devotion, path of love of God. Um, Krishna says, in the seventh verse, we had stopped at the seventh verse. He says, Bhavami Nachirat Partha Maya Veshita Cheta Samtesha Maham Samuddhatta Mrityu Samsara Sagarat. Seventh verse. He says, For those who love me, who surrender to me continuously in this way, I rescue them from samsara, the samsara of death. This continuously falling into the cycle of birth and death, 
being born and dying and uh, this um, this samsara basically uh, i i give them liberation uh, salvation moksha nirvana whatever you call them that i give them i become their rescuer i become their rescuer so by surrendering one of the teachers of bhakti pointed out notice by bhakti by devotion by surrendering to the lord you also attain all the results of good karma of dharma what is more punya what is better karma what is more meritorious than love of god the best thing one can do is to love god you attain all the results of meditation without meditating you will you may meditate but it's by bhakti by devotion that the result of meditation which is samadhi the absorption in god it is attained absorption in god is attained through love of god not through uh, the, what the yogi does by exercising a control a psychic control over the mind no it's just through love of god sri ramakrishna says in the gospel of sri ramakrishna that by intense love of god one attains kumbhaka so in pranayama in pranayama one breathes in and that is in breath and then holds the breath it is called kumbhaka that's meant for concentration and then releases the breath and then breathes in again but sri ramakrishna says even that kumbhaka that stillness of the breath is attained through intense devotion intense feeling for god can lead to kumbhaka so that means the result of of yoga of meditation is attained through bhakti without the actual procedure the mechanical procedure of yoga and gyan knowledge enlightenment that i am brahman that also is attained through bhakti without undergo, undergoing shravana manana niti dhyasana you know hearing and reflection and meditation no by the sheer grace of god if god wants god can give you that knowledge the, the only thing is the devotee is not hankering for samadhi hankering for self knowledge one um sadhu swami akhandananda ji of uh, sri ramakrishna's disciple so when he was on his way to the himalayas he went to kamakya which is in northeast of india in assam near guwahati it's a tantric uh, place so there was a sadhu there i forget his name he lived on the um, mountain uh, overlooking guwahati there's the chandi the you know the divine mother's uh, temple is there so uh, akhandananda went up there to see the, to bow down to the divine mother and also met this sadhu and this sadhu said what do you want he says i want to realize god become enlightened and then this sadhu who was a devotee of the divine mother he says oh so i see that you want self knowledge you want to realize brahman you don't love my mother <laughs> you don't love my mother one sadhu pointed out a monk pointed out see notice something subtle about these paths the um the doer of good wants the good the good karma the ethical life and the result of that is not loving god as such the yogi wants peace of mind yoga chitta vritti nirodha yoga is the cessation of the movements of the mind the absolute stillness of the mind is what the yogi values the gyani value self knowledge i am brahman yes they all uh, pay lip service to god by the grace of god i shall attain samadhi by the grace of god i shall realize i am brahman but they don't actually love god <laughs> they do after a fashion but that's not the whole point that's not the point the bhakta the, the devotee points this out you don't actually love god you want something from god no something very high no doubt about it it is the devotee who loves god and god responds to love god responds to love only thing is the devotee will get all of this the bhakta will get all of this will get enormous good karma will get samadhi deepest meditation will get self knowledge aham brahmasmi ityakara gyanam this kind of knowledge that i am brahman all of this will get however the devotee doesn't want these yeah. devotee is doesn't have a wish list so i love gods when am i getting enlightenment <laughs> not like that 
I am entirely at the mercy of the Lord. If He wishes to give me, if He, she wishes to give me, will do that. I am happy. If He does not wish to give me, or maybe later on, that's also I am happy, happy about that. So this is the advantage of bhakti. Now how does one become a lover of God like this? Because Sri Krishna is saying this is the best kind of yogi. And this is done with so much sweetness. So much sweetness. It is joyful. It is beautiful. So how does one become this um, um, bhakti yogi, the yogi in the path of love? Now we go into the actual practices. 8, 9, 10, 11 and 12 as a sort of summing up. The practices involved in this absorption in God through love, through surrender, depending on God. So what is to be done? Eighth very important verse. You can repeat after me. Mayeva mana adhatswa Mayeva mana adhatswa May buddhim niveshaya May buddhim niveshaya Nivasishyasi mayeva Nivasishyasi mayeva Ata udhvam na samshaya Ata udhvam na samshaya so what is to be done? Fix your mind on me alone. Let your intellect rest in me. You will live in me alone hereafter. There is no doubt about it. So verse number 8. Fix your mind and intellect. Manam is mind. And intellect, buddhi is intellect. So fix your mind and intellect on me. What is to be done? What is the practice now? In this path of devotion. And Krishna says two things. Only two things to be done. Only two things. Not a long list of preparations, practices, no. Just two things. Mind and intellect fix on me, fix on God. That's it. And, but that's a very big thing. <laughs> and then he will give. If he, will, in the path of devotion, it's full of concessions. The next verse will be, if you can't do this, do this. Then verse after that will be, if you can't do that either, then do this. There will be four verses like this. But first, this is the core, this is the, the essential message. Fix your mind on me. Fix your intellect on me. What's the difference? What's the difference? Mind is thought. Intellect is understanding. And then it is uh, in defined. Those who have studied Vedanta Sara, <coughs> you will understand the difference between the two. Um, in Sanskrit, the, the definition of mind, Sankalpa Vikalpatmakam Manaha. Mind is that which um, takes up, um, you know, which is basically a processing thing. Various kinds of thoughts keep churning around. This or that. Nishchayatmika buddhi. Intellect is that which is the determinative faculty which comes to an understanding. That is buddhi, intellect. So the mind goes through either this or that. Should I do this? Should I do that? The intellect says this is to be done. Is it like this or is it like that? The intellect says it's like this. The intellect is the one which understands. We have all gone through this process when we are students. Imagine, remember trying to, you know, solve a mathematics problem, for example. When you are churning it around in your mind, that's the mind. And when you get it, the aha moment, all right, I've got it now, I understand. That is the intellect. Intellect says, now I get it. It's the intellect which says, I don't understand. It's the intellect which says, I do understand. It is like this. The mind is the one which keeps processing. So various kinds of thoughts. So all our perceptions, they finally go to the mind. All our emotions are in the mind. What you feel about different things. All the thoughts about the world and yourself and people are in the mind. And the knowledge, the, the understanding, it's, it's basically the same instrument, inner instrument, it's called antakkarana, inner instrument. One level is mind, another level is intellect. Intellect is a higher level. Intellect is um, the level of understanding. Now both have to be focused on God. And here God, of course, literally means Krishna, but it can be me, it means Bhagavan, Ishwara, in any, any form, in any tradition, whichever way, any theistic tradition, if you believe in God. 
why are both why, why are both mentioned separately because it is quite possible that uh, one may make up one's mind god realization is my goal god is the highest so i fixed my understanding on god ostensibly but my mind may be all over the place at the end of the day and as monks we are told that in the morning you first um, start the day with the clarity why are you a monk and at the end of the day accounts <laughs> debit credit debit what did i do this uh, this day which takes me towards my goal and at the end of the day when you do the <laughs> accounts and you find loss terrible the whole day was spent in thinking of a hundred different things everything except god so you may you may be a monk you have made up your mind enlightenment is your goal god realization is your goal and the day and weeks and months may pass i mean not thinking much about god at all you will think definitely because you're a monk you're associated some but a lot of the time the mind is all over the place so the mind also what you have decided the goal of life god realization the mind also must think about that and the opposite is also possible you might be say a monk or a priest in a temple and the mind is busy with sacred stuff you know doing a puja um in the rituals teaching the gita but the intellect may may not take that as the highest the intellect may just think that you know priest in a temple so the intellect might be thinking so how many people came today how much money was given for the temple and uh, uh, am i going to get a new roof for my house so that's a, a priest the goal is is uh, not god realization the goal is money or fame or power or something like that so the intellect and the mind both have to be fixed on god that's why they are mentioned separately um our relationship with god is eternal it's already there it's already there but we don't feel it see from an advaitic perspective you are brahman you are brahman our connection is eternal you it's literally identity from an from non dual perspective it is you are that of course we are not talking about that perspective here we're talking about a devotional perspective non dual perspective is that you and god are one reality somebody sent me a cup from the united kingdom uh and it said uh, the cup has a smiley face and it says omg i am g <laughs> g is god <laughs> but we are not talking about that here we're talking about devotion to god even the devotional relationship with god is eternal but the problem is we don't here's the thing here's the problem the problem is we don't feel it it's not in our experience we may believe it but we don't feel it now the question is why don't we feel it why isn't our is it our isn't it our experience that god is real and we are eternally connected to god why isn't it there the reason is these two mind and intellect these two are connected are scattered in the world that's why we don't feel our connection with god mind and the intellect are world oriented and are scattered in the world that's why we don't feel our connection with god Swami Prabhavanand Ji in his very beautiful book um the Gos- the sermon on the mount according to vedanta so it's a commentary on the sermon on the mount in the new testament but from a vedantic perspective blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god now he raises the question how do i know that whether i am pure in heart or not blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god how do i know whether i am pure in heart or not and he says try this simple experiment just sit quietly and think that now i'm going to think about god or anything any blessed thing for the next 1 minute try you will see within seconds other thoughts intrude, intrude. unless you are a very trained meditator for most of us within seconds other thoughts will intrude but why how strange it is it that how, how strange it is that i have made up my mind to think about god and this is my mind I have made up my mind and yet I can't within second some other thoughts come in so that's the impurity of the heart the mind is scattered in the world and therefore lots of thoughts and feelings and apprehensions temptations desires all of these keep coming in anxieties 
repetitive patterns of thought they keep coming in the mind is given to so many things in the world it's given to um, uh, children to husband wife money um, property um, car and, uh, and the parking ticket and um, you know health and insurance and uh, relationships what not it's scattered in the world in dozens of different ways across the world A- and uh, um, anxieties also anxieties and fears temptations and desires memories habitual patterns of thinking it's scattered in the world in a hundred different ways and the more the mind is scattered if you scatter the mind in a hundred different ways it's guaranteed one thing is immediate the immediate result will be lack of peace lack of peace if the mind is focused on one thing there will be peace the danish philosopher soren kierkegaard he said purity of mind is to desire one thing only you might say but one can desire worldly things material things yeah but then in that case it will never be one thing only uh-huh. desiring one thing only purely deeply it generally it's god nothing else can absorb your mind entirely and to the exclusion of everything else temporarily it can some desire can take possession of you but generally over a lifetime only one desiring one thing only that's god so mayeva mana adhatsva fix your mind on me adhatsva the sanskrit word is it literally means place your mind in me place your mind in me placing is like you have a plate or a table and i place the clock on the table this is placing but to do that i have to catch hold of the clock to place the mind on god you have to catch hold of the mind and follow this carefully it's very simple but also subtle if you pra- i mean quite apart from theory the theory will tell you mind is that which goes through um, you know the processing capacity sankalpa vikalpa atmakam and all that's fine but right now if i were to put the mind on god what do you mean what's the mind i can understand put the clock on the table i understand here put the mind on god how what is what am i supposed to put where if you try to catch hold of the mind you will find nothing because it's formless it's not a physical entity so how do we catch hold of the mind the mind is caught hold of when it manifests and it keeps on manifesting when does it manifest when it has a vishaya an object you think of um did i park uh, in the right place then that's the mind what was the object your anxiety regarding parking but what manifested in the mind there's no parking no car nothing in the mind in in your head the mind manifested i am hungry if you feel that's the mind is manifested hunger is the object the mind manifests says i am hungry so um i am anxious i am i feel warm or i feel cold all of these are objects heat cold anxiety i get it i don't get it these are all objects but what's manifesting all throughout is the mind 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 so the mind manifests with when it catches hold of an object sa vishaya in sanskrit vishaya when an object is there then the mind manifests as what's called a chitta vritti a movement in the lake of the mind and each movement has a content the content is the object why am i saying all this here is the point placing the mind on god means replacing the content of the mind with god the mind keeps on you right now you'll see the mind has many objects it goes from one thing to another thing to another thing instead of one thing to another thing to another thing you replace it with god and god and god in whichever form it could be krishna it could be rama and so on just by the way a uh, little aside um the way of knowledge and the um way of devotion we sometimes make you know 
an unnecessary uh, division someone might say that oh you know that i am not the body not the mind i am witness consciousness uh, vedanta right uh, that's my thing and all this uh, what is all this rama temple and uh, uh, as we said i just read hanuman came into the rama temple this morning and everybody is this is a big news this kind this kind of thinking looking down on it's a big mistake so the gyani looks down on the bhakta thinking that's for silly people dumb people and the real thing is i'm not the body not the mind i'm pure consciousness no it's the same reality that's the beauty of sri ramakrishna he says in bengali uh, but in the, the english equivalent would be a pie or a piece of pizza if you eat it like this and if you eat it like that you're literally eating the same thing and f- and he says whether you have the highest philosophy and an inquiry philosophical inquiry into who am i or you are worshiping god in full devo- in, in in de- simple devotion as my lord ramachandra you are actually experiencing the same reality so it is uh, there's no need to think that this path is um, superior that path is inferior or this is true and that's false this is real spirituality that's superstition not at all not at all in whichever way so this is just an aside um back to placing the mind on god means replacing the object of each vritti with god and that one can do in many many ways many many ways i heard from a senior devotee here that swami t swami tathagatanand ji told her that if you want to be saved read read holy books read holy books means what suppose as i i say that i cannot meditate on god all the time fine but keep your mind on god or something related to god a scripture uh, um uh, you know the stories of the lives of saints read what 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 is reading doing it's giving an object to the mind so you are placing your mind on god through the reading you can place your mind on god through the mantra if you have been initiated into mantra so how to place the mind on god and uh, the same thing applies to the intellect also the uh, intellect generally concerns itself with the world outside so it is continuously analyzing the world trying to understand the world in our common sense in our day to day life also inquiries in science and philosophy it's all an inquiry into the world and um, here krishna is saying you that inquiry should be about about god and the most powerful determination to make in the intellect is my goal is god realization you know to tell yourself that i am a god seeker that determination who am i what am i i am a spiritual seeker it's not just for monks and for uh, you know um, mirabai and ramakrishna what is, it's true of mirabai and ramakrishna it's also true of me i too am seeking god let that be my identity that's the intellect the intellect has, has to make up its mind who am i what am i what do i see myself as one might think but swami that is might be true for you but it's not true for us no 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 krishna is speaking to arjuna they arjuna is a warrior in the middle of the world he is married he has children and grandchildren they are all actually pretty old if you see if you calculate the years they are all uh, senior citizens all of these people <laughs> who are fighting wars and stuff <laughs> uh, they all had grandchildren yes so uh, they they had wives and children and grandchildren their kingdoms to run they were men of the world the people who who krishna is talking to here so yes you can be in the world you can be in an ashram you can be in a mountain top you can be in a forest or you can be in city and your whole goal can be god realization 
in and through the activities of the world. In fact, maturity is when you are spiritual. So, it's not that you have to actually formally become a monk. You become monk-like. You become spiritual. That is, you, you see yourself as a spiritual seeker. Wherever you are, whatever the profession is, whatever the profession, the worst of professions is fighting a war. And Arjuna is fighting a war. In the middle of that, if he can be spiritual, we can all be spiritual. There's no excuse. So, the buddhi, the intellect must make up, they must uh, make the determination, I see God. Goal of life is God realization. Goal of my life is God realization. I can, I should and I must seek God. This identity. Many of us have already got it. That's why we are here actually. But to make it very explicit in our minds. This is who I am. You will immediately get peace. A little bit of peace at least and continuous. You will get it. The moment you make up your mind. I am a God seeker. Everything else will be there. There will be family, there will be money, there will be jobs, everything else. Um, all the um, pluses and minuses, all the problems of life and the, uh, they, they will all circle around. But the central thing should be, uh, I am a spiritual seeker. Then life takes on um, this higher dimension that uh, we are a sadhaka, uh, spiritual practitioner, spiritual seeker. Now, once having done that, then you see how, how, how do you place Mayeva Mana How do you place the mind on God? Place it in time. This is the time for meditation. This is the time for prayer. This is the time for the Vedanta class. Time. Take off a particular, mark it off. This is the time. This is the time. This is Krishna Janmashtami. This is Ram Navami. This is Shivaratri. This is Durga Puja, this is Christmas, this is Easter, this is Buddha Purnima. Time, a marking of time in, in the continuous flow of time, this is the point. Now this time is reserved for placing my mind on God. This is a holy time. The time in your day, the time in your week, the time in the common calendar. Pick up those times. Place. This corner of my room is reserved for meditation and nothing else. For my devotional practices and meditation. This is a meditation center. This is a shrine. This is a temple. Place. You're picking up particular places. There the mind, in that place, the mind will be given to God. In that time, the mind will be given to God. You see, in space and time. So this is uh, Ayodhya, this is Kashi, this is Banaras, this is Makkah, this is Jerusalem, Assisi. These are places, place, space. Look, it is true what Vedanta says. All times, one should think of God at all times. And one, can, one should think of God at all places because God is in all time and spaces in God. It is true. The ones who have made these arrangements, holy place and holy time, they know this. They know this very well. They know it better than us. But still they have arranged these things. Why? Why? This helps us to place the my mind in God. Mayeva mana adhatsva. Place your mind in me. Little bit of Sanskrit. The, the original verse says, Mayeva, in me alone, to the exclusion of everything else, place your mind. And then it says, May buddhim nivesha, you merge your intellect, or, you know, nivesha literally, literally means like segue, like merge it in. Uh, so, like you merge traffic, like that. May buddhim nivesha, so the commentator says that eva, only in me, that should be added to the, the, into that buddhi also. So, only in me keep your mind, only into me merge your intellect. In the intellect, make up your mind, that make up the intellect that I am, uh, uh, my goal of life is God realization. Whole of spiritual life in Buddhism begins with this. This is called Samyak Drishti. Samyak Drishti. Uh, uh, 
proper, uh, the right philosophy of life. This is samsara. It is not working. I am in trouble. <laughs> Most of us don't realize this. But I am in trouble. Things are not going to get better. Young, only young people think things, things are going to get better. <laughs> things aren't. Middle-aged people know that already. Elderly people also know that. Things are not going to get better. They're going to be like this. You reach a peak and then quickly <laughs> down. So, um, this is samsara. And I need to um, need help. So enlightenment, spiritual realization is necessary. So, this is samyak drishti, a, a right philosophy of life. And that's followed by samyak sankalpa, a right resolution. Buddhism, Ashtanga, eight noble, eightfold uh, path of Buddhism. Samyak um, sankalpa, right resolution. Yes, this is the problem, this is samsara, and here is the solution. Here is bhakti, here is jnana, here is yoga. I will do this, I'll be a yogi, I'll be a karma yogi, bhakti yogi, jnana yogi, raja yogi. This is the determination. It has no conflict at all with what we are doing in life. Those things can continue. So, mai eva mana adhatsva, mai eva buddhim nivesha, mai eva, only in me, to the exclusion of other things. Use the power of imagination. Feel the presence of God. There is a very beautiful Christian book, uh, Practice of the Presence of God. Those are letters of Brother Lawrence. He was a cook in a kitchen. And he was continuously living in the presence of God. All day long he was busy. And there was not a simple kitchen. It's a kitchen of a, of a monastery. So, so very busy. And he was doing basically going out for groceries and preparing vegetables and you know the food for so many people, monks, every day. And it's very touching, these letters that he says that I always pray to the Lord that only if you hold my hand that I can do whatever I have to do, I, have to, I can do it properly. It's very natural that I will make mistakes. If you are not there with me, I will continuously make mistakes. This is, this is my, my nature. Always feel the presence of God. Use the, the faculty of imagination that the Lord is present with me, is walking with me, is in my heart. I am concerned with the Lord, not with the world and its people. It's all internal, all right? Don't, don't advertise it. Don't change your Facebook status. <laughs> Not meant for advertisement. It's, uh, it's entirely an internal attitude. People should not know. They will come to know eventually over um, months and years. They'll see the difference in you and they'll be touched by it and they will get peace from you and they'll feel inspired. But that's later. First of all, internal and very private, very internal. So place your mind in me. Use the power of imagination. Think about God. Argue with God. Question God. Place your sorrows and your complaints to God. Internally. Not to people. We may think we are devotees. We believe in God. But at the first sign of trouble, we, the, even the thought that I have to take this to God doesn't come to us. Either we worry ourselves sick or we run to other people. First of all, go to God. God is real. God is there. Mai eva manadhatsva mai buddhim niveshaya. Merge your understanding in me. Then what will happen? Nivasasya si mai eva ata udhvam na samshaya. It says, um, You will dwell in me after this. Atta Urdhvam, beyond this, after this. What do you mean after this? The commentator here says, and um, this is one commentary, Sridhar Swami's commentary. It says, Atta um, Urdhvam, beyond this, Dehante Marananantaram, after death of the body, Mayeva Nivasishyasi. You will dwell in me after death. So that's one meaning. After this means. After the death of this body, after the after this life, uh, you will go to Vaikuntha, the Christian heaven, or the Buddhist pure land, whatever it is, and and dwell there. 
But another meaning is not after death. Atta Uddham means when you place your mind in me, when you are in, you place your intellect in me, after that, in this life, while living, you will dwell in me. And dwell in me does not mean you will go to a heaven and dwell in that heaven, you know, next door, neighborhood of God. No. Dwell in me. Here God says, you dwell in me, in God. In God. This is a very Vedantic way of looking at it. That we actually are one with God. We are that one limitless existence consciousness place. So we are actually immersed in God. Everywhere here. We just don't see it. One uh, little point here. Intellect. I was just reading yesterday. So the intellect is busy trying to understand the world. And Krishna here says, fix your intellect upon me. Even if you try to understand, investigate the world, how you are thrown back upon the mystery of God or of the, of the ultimate reality, that I was <laughs> so taken aback to read. I was just reading this wonderful little book um, by Carlo Rovelli. Have you heard of Carlo Rovelli? He is a quantum physicist. Um, very, he is a popularizer of, of physics and writes very well. He's Italian. But his books have been translated into English. So I was reading this book, Hel uh, Helgoland. Uh, it's uh, the theory of quantum physics and how it has revolutionized our understanding of the universe. It's a small book, but very elegantly written, as his books are. And he says, now notice, this is not about religion, not even about Vedanta, um, or, or you know, spirituality or nothing like that. Far from Krishna and Bhakti and all that. It's about quantum physics. Quantum theory. And he says, I and one of my colleagues, we were contemplating what this really means for reality, for the world, how it changes, how quantum th theory changes our understanding of the world. And he says, we came to the conclusion that this means there is no reality. <laughs> the more you investigate, See, this kind of physics we learnt as school children. So I, I am not a physicist and, and this is, I'm entering into, you know, the fool's rush in where angels fear to, tre fear to tread. So I'm rushing in where I have no competence at all. The kind of physics we read as kids uh, in school, that this universe is composed of tiny particles which are guided by um, immaterial force, um, uh, material forces, but invisible forces. So there are a certain number of forces in this universe and there are Particles is part matter, energy, uh, space, and time, force, uh, energy or force, and matter, and this is how the universe is. Well, it isn't. Breaking news. <laughs> That's what twentieth century quantum physics revealed that it's not like that at all. Not like that at all. He has discussed how this these insights came to first to Heisenberg, then Schrödinger. The world is not at all what what classical physics was trying to say, and uh, that drove. And Carlo Rovelli mentions that drove uh, Schrödinger to his interest in Advaita Vedanta. So uh, he, what's behind the veil of Maya? Of course, according to Carlo Rovelli, all our investigations, and this is not even uh, Vedanta or spirituality or. Um, not even philosophy, it's just hard science. This is our, all our investigation shows behind the veil of Maya there is nothing. <laughs> the veil of Maya is all that there is. So this is an investigation into the objective nature of things. We know from a Vedantic perspective what we want to say. And then at the end of that book, it's all about Nagarjuna. The uh, theory of emptiness. The emptiness people in the school of emptiness in Buddhism. And then he says, we, I was breaking my head trying to understand what quantum uh, physics means for this world, for our understanding of, of the universe. And then I came across somebody, I, I, I would keep coming across people who said, have you read Nagarjuna? And when the umpteenth time somebody said, have you read Nagarjuna? I thought I'd give it a go. And I read this book, the verses on the middle, middle path, Mula Madhyamaka Karika, written 2000 years ago by this Buddhist monk. Um, and he says, it was a revelation to me. He read the book 
uh, translated and commented by his, by an American analytic philosopher J Garfield who happens to be the teacher from whom I studied Madhyamaka Buddhism so I dashed off an email to him uh, yes today he is very famous for completing all his email the same day 24 hours so he lived up to his reputation i just got back an email from him. i said did you know that this connection between qu- quantum mechanics and the interpretation of nagarjuna especially your interpretation of nagarjuna by carlo rovelli and he, had, he said in his email yes i actually met carlo rovelli and we had a uh, uh, discussion and we're going to have a discussion on we hit it up very well and we're going to have a discussion about this on dutch tv uh, very soon <laughs> so you see even a scientific investigation buddhi if you investigate the world you end up with a paradox at the very least you, you might say what what is the alternative the alternative could be that you could have completed physics you, you could have uh, just um, you know just said that yes what we studied in school that's the final answer there are these little bits bit little bits of um, matter uh, pushed along by forces and that is the universe finished physics is complete no 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 so mai buddhin niveshaya uh, the intellect also should be fixed on me on god that's a theistic answer the commentator also here says he gives an interesting addition natra samshaya there is no um doubt here there's no doubt here you will dwell on god uh, obviously we are already dwelling in god we don't experience it but if you fix your mind on god and you fix your intellect on god you will experience it you will feel very soon it will become a living reality for you and then he says at the end at the end of this physical this particular life this commentator here gives a nice quotation dehante deva starakam parabrahma vyachaste if you live like this at the end of your days the moment of death god will um re- will give you what what it says is the tarak brahma mantra which will liberate you at the point of death at the point of death this is a nice connection to what sri ramakrishna saw in kashi in banaras there's a um belief among hindus that if you die in banaras you will get liberation even if you are not at all spiritual not practicing bhakti or anything at all just die in banaras you will get liberation that's a belief and sri ramakrishna had a mystical vision in banaras where he saw the dead bodies being burnt in the um, um cremation pyres and he had a vision of shiva and the divine mother annapurna so shiva there in banaras is vishwanath and annapurna is the divine mother and he saw the divine mother in his words i saw the divine mother cutting the bonds of worldliness of the departing souls and shiva giving the what he called tarak brahma mantra what the tarak brahma mantra depends upon your school of vedanta the hari krishnas will say it is hari ram hari krishna the gyanis will say i am brahman this realization whatever it is So Shiva gives you that realization the divine mother releases you from all worldly bondages and Shiva gives you enlightenment you are free from samsara at the point of death he mentions this and he says you don't have to wait live in kashi and die there if you fix your mind on god fix your intellect on god and live like that so that's a still a tall order still a tall order in case you can't do that there are easier alternatives good somebody had a question If you have a question, there will be a microphone. They will come to you with a microphone. Raise your hand. The lady here uh, t- on this side. Yes. Tell us your name and ask the question. Um, Pranam Swamiji, I'm Meenal. Uh, I'm just uh, still trying to dwell a little bit on the subtle difference that you mentioned between the mind and the intellect. I, I, am I right in thinking that the mind is all my thoughts and the intellect is a distillation of those thoughts intellect like is understanding the, i'll give you the technical definition and then it will help us to notice what is intellect and what is mind intellect is the technical definition is nischayatmika antakarana vritti buddhi that a uh, movement of the inner instrument so whatever is going on internally first person is the inner instrument 
again the distinction between inner and outer instrument outer instruments is our five senses which are in touch with the world eyes are in touch with forms ears with sound nose with uh, with um, you know smell and so on but the mind is not directly in touch with the external world the mind is in touch with the inputs given to it by the sense organs so the mind is entirely internal that mind in inner instrument mind has certain subtle different functions one of those functions is buddhi nischaya atmika that means the determinative faculty i am sarva priyananda sitting here this is knowledge for me this is not what i'm thinking i need not think it it's obvious to me like that so that's knowledge but i may be thinking many things in my mind which might be in the of the nature of speculation anxiety emotion desire all of that is mind the technical definition of mind sankalpa vikalpa vikalpa atmaka manah so this is in sanskrit it's called sankalpa vikalpa the up thinking of this swinging to and fro like a pendulum is it this or is it that um, various feelings various options this is mind and when it comes to a conclusion that's intellect could be wrong but that's intellect yeah yes the gentleman there the two gentlemen there swami <coughs> my name is ron uh, i have a question it, it may be um, for another day <laughs> it's like large but you mentioned antakarana is yes. the inner organ and uh traditionally four parts yes. manas buddhi ahankara who familiar with but also mentions chitta yes. which often is uh, defined as the heart and um i was wondering with this whole subject of devotion how the chitta fits in right so what he has just pointed out the inner instrument when you talk about the inner instrument traditionally it's divided into four components here krishna speaks only about two mind and intellect manas and buddhi but the inner instrument is traditionally mano buddhi chitta ahankara mind intellect ego i and their chitta does not mean the heart in the fourfold division it means the memory the storehouse so chitta chit is heart that's different but chitta here is the memory the storehouse our our subconscious our storehouse of memories so all four taken together in english we just say mind so it includes all of these uh, components now when krishna says mind and intellect once the mind and intellect are fixed on god the uh, ego also will follow and the memory the storehouse of memory is over time purified good thoughts keep going into it the gentleman next to you yes so me my name is sham um so my question is uh, is there a way to incorporate bhakti when when uh, a theistic god doesn't appeal to you so can you have bhakti without an object in the mind not so easily um, bhakti is with an object she the path of non dual vedanta is precisely difficult because of this that when you when we begin to understand what is meant by non dual vedanta is is just us but not an object yeah. that's why someone like carlo rovelli might say with with a full scientific investigation of the objective universe you come to you coming to the scary he says it's a vertigo inducing <laughs> uh, idea that there is no reality outside it's just a tissue it's like a, the veil of maya is just a veil what's behind the veil nothing but what's in it's not behind the veil the reality is not an object uh, it's 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 you the subject but the pure subject what will the mind grasp it cannot it is that which illumines the mind you realize you are that but then what will you put the mind on you cannot if you really really want an object to put the mind on then you need god Vivekananda put it this way he says it is this very atman as if seen from the outside is you your real nature as if seen from the outside means instead of say instead of going through the process of i am not the body i am not the mind you say i you just keep yourself intact i am this person and the ultimate reality is god so you have in a sense objectified it you might say but that's there's uh, 
there is a lot of the mind in that yes it is it is definitely it is the ultimate reality coated with the mind you have given it a, a mental cultural uh, religious coating but that's why i said that uh, sri ramakrishna would say it's the same reality now that doesn't answer your question what what if i it does, does doesn't appeal to me if i don't have devotion well so much the poorer but we we don't have devotion but still um hold on to the advaitic path then hold on to the non dual inquiry path and i am that and if that fulfills you good enough good enough yeah it's the same reality and it's uh, as long as we don't have any need for this but what we do in our order is that we try to uh, practice all four the path of knowledge path of devotion path of uh, meditation and the path of service it's a wholesome balanced approach and the harmony of four yogas now nobody among us is actually balanced <laughs> each of us has some preference but we try to cultivate the other now if that is not natural to you what will happen is it will feel mechanical so the path of knowledge might feel very natural to you and the path of devotion might feel forced but that's not the fault of the path of devotion it's just that i have not developed that faculty in within myself so even if it is forced even if it's mechanical keep a little bit of it keep some component of devotion in your life keep some component of devotion some component of meditation some component of service in your life and of course the self knowledge yeah the gentleman is right at the back two there are two hands up there we'll conclude with those questions none of you have questions um yeah <coughs> Hi, my name is Shobita. Yes. Um, I happen to be getting a PhD in quantum physics. Oh, then um, the, you are the expert. <laughs> I differ. <laughs> I'm in my where, final year. Where are you? I'm right here. Okay. All right. Um, I happen to be in my final year and I feel like all I've learned is that at uh, Schrodinger, so one of the scientists you mentioned, he actually says that any scientist that makes an observation in quantum physics, he himself becomes part of the nature, right? So the observer essentially becomes god because you essentially become the person making the observation. And I take that to mean exactly what you said where the observer you are god. You are me, I am you, ergo we are all one, we are the supreme being. Okay, so I I preface that because I feel like the deeper I go into um like school and quantum physics and Hinduism the deeper I realize that it's just an explanation for everything I've learned growing up but to me I come to this point where um my mom and I were in Kathmandu last month um and we were talking about why every student or every child essentially isn't raised to just be a monk like why shouldn't we all just let everything go like forget about school and knowledge and jobs and essentially focus on just learning hinduism if that is or like the teachings of vedanta if that is the ultimate goal cuz when mm. i asked my mom why i shouldn't just quit school and quit like everything materialistic in this world and just try to focus on like a, being a true devotee of god if that is the essential purpose that like I am even studying quantum in the first place is for and she got really scared <laughs> and I don't understand why yeah. she she's not like why all parents aren't more supportive and like I don't know is that a silly question No it's it's a really good question um I remember this happened I think either to Vivekananda or Abhedananda this young person I forget whether it was a young man or a woman who came up to him after one of the talks on Vedanta when when Vivekananda was here in this country and seriously asked him is this true what you are saying vivekananda said yes and then they never saw him again he ap- apparently went away from worldly life and retreated into a log cabin or something and meditated for the rest of his days or something like that happened now um the point is that if this is true what else matters and if this is not true then what else matters <laughs> Yes. Now there um there is the great wisdom of I would say Hinduism as the mother of all religions. What you are saying is a very buddhistic approach is that 
this is true wow let's do this give up everything else but it will not work for everybody it won't that's the wisdom of this ancient mother of all religions that we are all placed in different um, different places in our spiritual evolution what you find absolutely fascinating will not leave a single mark on the mind of the person next to you um, the other person might just shrug ah, all right <laughs> whatever it is so and you'll be surprised that what is so amazing for you uh, the next person is not interested at all so what hinduism does is all right so these are these people who are scattered on an entire spectrum how do we help everybody wherever they are so there must be something for everybody something for everybody that's why you have advaita vedanta for you and schrodinger uh, and the carlo rovelli but you also have uh, um, ram and ayodhya and the uh, krishna temple and the rama temple and the devotion simple devotion to god for, you have uh, and everything in between you have got this entire range and the genius of hinduism is to say that we are all touching the same reality in all these different ways in all these different ways that reality has infinite aspects and so we can approach it through infinite different ways but yes what you said absolutely um, when you have this insight then you grasp it with both of your hands and uh, investigate it fully investigate it through knowledge investigate it through through devotion through meditation and through service and all of that i ha- i have a friend who is a cutting edge mathematician his work is in topology and is used in string theory and somebody asked him you're a monk why do you do mathematics and he said this is my karma yoga this is my karma yoga god has given me this talent for mathematics so this is how i'm serving as long as i you know this is one way i, I can uh, i can serve humanity i can serve people in science so very good i mean you you follow it see the thing is through quantum physics through this investigation in physics it gives you a second person approach to it that all right this may be true this is what it's revealing to me all these investigations vedanta also wants you to have a first person experience of it that i in my own lived experience this should become a living reality for me yeah so all of the paths in vedanta especially the path of knowledge but also meditation and devotion and service all of them seek to give us this direct god experience you need not call it even a god experience you can call it experience of the ultimate reality experience of our real nature whatever you want to call it yeah but i'm very glad to hear that there was another hand up next to you it's okay oh, that's that yeah somebody here yes we will we'll conclude with this question forcing her to ask a question <laughs> actually i had a question in my mind and then i'll use it <laughs> my name is rajonna so i have a question uh, like in my life i've seen a lot of a uh, people with lot of devotion but w- i have seen some problem with that again like who are doing it correctly that's not the thing but who are in the journey as you said we should try to imagine god right and try to feel that but there comes some problem with that imagination i have seen like they get obsessed with something like superstitions in some way like yes. okay this flower should be placed placed in this way that way and so what i'm trying to and also like you said like if you are going through some sad days like talk to god but then what i'm trying to say you don't get a reply back in some sense right mm. but if you talk to a friend maybe some console consolation and all that. so how to tackle those problems of devotion yes first of all this is we're talking about poor devotion to god often there are a lot of people who have some faith and devotion to god lots of faith that's what mass religion is basically but that kind of faith or devotion is mixed with worldly desire i want something in this world out of god and that leads to problems now love of god for the sake of god that's number one that's difficult but that's what krishna is talking about here that leads to enlightenment and freedom second yes talk to god but 
then you don't, don't get a response. Somebody said, actually a psychiatrist said, that uh, talk to God all you want, that's very good. The problem starts when God starts talking back to you. <laughs> yes. That's why we insist on the four, the harmony of the four yogas. Yes, devotion, but balance it with knowledge, with a strong dose of logic and rationality and common sense. Balance it with meditation. Balance the meditation also with service, action. I was just reading Swami Turiyananda and Swami Shivananda will end with that. They're sitting and talking and Swami Shivananda says, In this day and age, Sri Ramakrishna's teaching was Jnana Mishra Bhakti. Bhakti with knowledge. Devotion and knowledge together. Good. So let's wrap up here. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu